And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brunstein, who is going to talk about, um, again, different uh, choices for um, hematopoietic cell transplant. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to come to San Diego. Too bad it's only for 24 hours. But um, anyway, so if there is one message I'd like you to take home today is that finding a donor for a blood transplant is rarely a barrier this, in this day and age uh, for patients to undergo this potentially curative treatment. And the reason for that is that despite the, once you, the primary donor type is our siblings. And, but uh, families are becoming smaller, and this is uh, data from the uh, NMDP and CIBMTR showing on your left panel the probability of uh, having siblings as you age. So the older families were bigger, the, small, the new families are smaller, so people have less siblings to type. And also, as you age, uh, the probability that your, that your sibling will be matched and will be available goes lower because the siblings are older if they haven't died yet. You know, we now treat patients up to the age of 75 with transplant, sometimes even older, and their siblings may have passed away. Uh, they may not have parents anymore, and even if they're around, Every once in a while, it's happened already once this year, we find some other medical problem um, like leukemia in, in the potential donor. Uh, the, alter the primary alternative over many years has been the unrelated donors. And, and this is um, also data from the, uh, CI from the NMDP where we're looking at, and the CIBMTR, where we're looking at donor availability. Unrelated donors has been the silver or gold standard of alternative donors uh, for many years. And as you can find here, we can find you know, this type of donor for almost everybody when we do confirmatory typing. But I want you to focus on the, on the box on, the far, uh, on your far right, where you see that once we have everything done, the availability of that donor goes down to 50% if you're a white Caucasian, but it goes down to the 30% uh, for, for minorities. And the, in some populations, uh, like in African Americans, it's only about 20%. So unrelated donors by themselves would not close completely, not completely co close the gap. And, but the question is, if we go to, from a sibling donor, that's the standard of care or the gold standard, uh, to alternative donors, what happens? You know, how much are we losing for doing that? Why are we insisting in doing sibling transplants? Um, and the, I, I think the answer is we don't lose much. If we lose anything, we don't lose much. And in the left side, you have uh, a study uh, from the CIBMTR, both studies here from the CIBMTR. On the left, we're comparing umbilical core blood to a matched unrelated donor to a mismatched unrelated donor. And on the right panel, you have a haploidentical, which is a partially matched, half-matched donor to the patient. Uh, and you see that this is comparing to unrelated donors, and you see that the survival, the survival uh, for all these donor types is quite similar. Even the curves come down more or less to the same place. What's different between these donor types is why people fail, how you get to those 40, 50 percent long-term survivors. And that's what I'm going to address a little bit in the next uh, few slides. So in, in donor transplantation, each donor type has its pros and cons. Uh, donor choice is based largely on availability and sometimes in institutional preference. If you come to Minnesota, you would preferably get core blood. If you go to Johns Hopkins, you're going to get a haplo. Uh, there are no adequate prospective data, um, and we'll get back to that in the very last slide. Institutional practice is influenced, of course, by their experience and by their research interests. And, of course, very importantly, with all these donor types, the reason those survival curves are similar is that technological advances and supportive care improvements have made transplants safer and better overall. It's still far from ideal to have only half of your patients or... 40% of them surviving long term. So there is a lot of room for improvement, and that's why you're all working on, on ways that we can modify and enhance the function or redu reduce the complications of treatments like uh, stem cell therapy with uh, hematopoietic progenitors. So as I said, if a sibling donor is the gold standard, the silver standard is probably the unrelated. It's, the silver standard are the unrelated donors. And the primary source of unrelated donors are the registries. The uh, primary register that we all consult is the National Marrow Donor Program. Uh, the last time I did this slide, there were 25 million volunteers registered worldwide, uh, a lot of them in the US. Um, obtaining 
Enough cells, an adequate graft from an unrelated donor is essentially the rule, just like a sibling donor. With rare exceptions, we're not going to get enough cells. There is very low risk of graft rejection, and there are additional progenitors or immune cells potentially available for additional cell therapies if you need to go back to that donor for, for example, donor lymphocyte infusions, which is a treatment for relapse or poor engraftment. Uh, the disadvantages of uh, unrelated donors uh, is that donor choice is limited by HLA matching. You need to match fairly closely, and I'll go back to that as we get a little more stringent over time, but we're also learning how to better match these patients. Minorities are poorly represented in the registry for unrelated donors uh, and also for the registries for cord blood, uh, but we can still find donors for them. Donors may not be available in 50 to 70% of the time, as I just showed you. And there is a higher risk of graft-versus-host disease compared to the other donor types, in particular if mismatched. But, and therefore, I'd say that better, the better understanding of HLA matching and uh, better supportive care and treatments and prevention of graft-versus-host disease is probably one of the areas that um, requires the most attention for unrelated donor transplantation. There are two studies uh, that were published, you know, one in 2007 on your left, one in 2011 on your right. One is with bone marrow, which was the first thing we used to do. We used to collect bone marrow. That's why it's called a bone marrow transplant. Nowadays, most of the bone marrow transplants are actually done with peripheral blood, collect from the blood of patients by mobilized peripheral blood. Uh, the two studies were not exactly the same, but they had thousands of patients, and uh, they kind of set the standard for what we do today. And uh, I'm going to use the, the Stephanie Lee's study uh, from Blood 2007 to try to go over what are the main points of this study. So I think the most important finding is that when you are uh, well-matched, when you have an 8 of 8 match, this should be the, the, the standard for, for this type of donor. But note that for every degree of mismatch that we add to these patients, and this was done retrospectively, there is, in this case, there is a drop in five-year survival as we increase mismatch. There is an increase in toxic uh, and treatment-related mortality. In this case, there is no effect in relapse, and we'll go back to that a little later when I talk about core blood. There is a uh, decreasing risk of graft-versus-host disease, but keep in mind that graf chronic graft-versus-host disease is a late effect and that mortality over time is a competing risk for that. Uh, acute graft versus host disease goes much higher, and that's in part responsible for that increased mortality, and graft rejection also goes higher and is also responsible for, the, responsible for increased mortality. So very important. The more mismatched they are, the better we need to do with prevention of GVH and, and supportive care. And here's an opportunity for graft engineering and um, cellular and molecular interventions. Um, HLA mismatch is not all, this does not seem to be all, this, all the same. And here it seems that if you have an HLA match, uh, mismatch at A, it may be worse than if you have an HLA mismatch at B. But keep in mind that when they did the subgroup analysis, you know, the numbers have fallen substantially. It's still, most would, th would agree that if you have an antigen mismatch, it tends to be worse than an allele mismatch because of essentially what we're looking into in the, in the mismatch, we're looking at the beta sheath in the, in, the, in the HLA and looking at the antigen recognition site. And if you have just a few substitutions in an allele mismatch, it's um, sometimes the, the, protein rec the, antigen rec the antigen recognition here is exactly the same. Whereas if you get an, a complete antigen mismatch, uh, then there is uh, really no antigen recognition and you can have more, worse GVHD. But this is a study published by Joseph Pidala in which he looked and found that in some cases where certain sequences have the same, the, even with changes in the uh, antigen rec recognition pocket, there is no change in antigen recognition for different alleles. That can be a permissive uh, uh, mismatch and it would not affect the TRM or the survival of those patients. But then... Um, more recently, in the same lines of that, uh, Dr. Petersdorf from uh, Seattle published that not only the, um, the sequence is important, but also the expression, because you can have uh, certain, yeah, and they look in specific at HLA-DP, which, which is a low side that we don't always match for in unrelated donor transplantation. 
And in, the, in this case, they found that was the expression of HLA-DP on the, on the cells of the recipient that was able to determine uh, the increased risk of graft versus host disease. And I'll take just another minute just to uh, try to explain this. So if, if I have, if I need a transplant and I have a high expression DP and I am mismatched for that DP, I am more likely to develop graft versus host disease because that's gonna be very visible. So if a patient has a donor that is mismatched for the high expression uh, allele versus a low expression allele in the same patient, we should always mismatch for the low expression allele to minimize the risk of GVHD, and that would be a permissive mismatch that would have less impact or no impact in the outcomes. So this is another opportunity. If we could modulate uh, expression of HLA or, uh, or engineer the cells so that they can see this less well, could also potentially have an effect in uh, transplant outcomes. But now I'm gonna change gears on you and I'm gonna talk about the partially matched uh, related donors, which are the haploidentical donors that are only half matched to the recipient. The advantages of a haploidentical donor is that almost everyone has one, you know, if you, unless you, you are a, you've been adopted, your parents died, and you don't have any children, you have a haplo in the world, uh, a related haplo in the world. Um, they're rapidly available and they tend to be very motivated. Your children should hopefully be motivated to help you. <laughs> Doesn't always happen though. Uh, addition, <laughs> additional progenitors and immune cells are potentially available, but here, here is a trick. You know, it's a tricky thing because, yes, they're available, but giving additional lymphocytes from a haploidentical donor is very dangerous and it has been done, but um, not always with uh, the expected uh, success. And again, as you know, we think of a, a gene and cell therapy meeting and all the work that you've all been doing, here's another, you know, uh, another area where uh, a little bit of engineering could be very helpful. Um, and then haploidentical donors uh, will favor uh, NK cell allo reactivity, and I'll go back to that uh, in a little bit. Uh, the disadvantages of haploidentical donors is that it requires some kind of in vitro or in vivo T cell depletion. There is a high risk of infection and sometimes relapse, but this is somewhat dependent uh, on the platform. There is delayed immune reconstitution, and, and there is some delayed immune reconstitution. But this is all variable, and it changes depending on which flavor of haplodonor you're using. And this, these are just some of them. Uh, I'd say that uh, in the US, the ones that we've been using the most are the post-transplant cyclophosphamide depletion of T cells in vivo. So you give the cells to the patient, and I actually have a slide. Mm. Here we go. I'll go back to that one. Uh, you give the cells to the patient after the conditioning regimen. Don't give any immunosuppression. Let all the alloreactive T cells proliferate, get activated, and get angry against the patient. And on day three and four, you give uh, high doses of cyclophosphamide to kill them off. And that does not kill the stem cells. Stem cells are not sensitive to cyclophosphamide. And um, after that, you start immunosuppression. And with that strategy, uh, it has extended and expanded the use of haploidentical donors around the country and around the world significantly. Other alternatives are the use of CD3 depletion and also more, a more refined way of doing it, which is the depletion of only alpha-beta T cells uh, from the graft. And, and some uh, groups are actually starting uh, to study the possibility of trying to save those alpha-beta T cells and perhaps expanding them in the laboratory for later doing dose-escalated uh, DLIs uh, for better graft-versus-leukemia effect. Um, as I mentioned before, um, haploidenticals, I, I don't mean for you to see any of this, it's just a, an example, it's a nice cartoon. Um, but NK cells um, are educated by activating and suppressive signals, and Dan Kaufman can certainly tell way more about that than I can. But essentially, NK cells are the first cells that come back up after T cell depletion. It happens in haploidentical donors, and it happens after core blood transplant, because there are two instances where there is very few T cells after the grafting, and NK cells are an important part of the innate immune system, and they can definitely contribute to the control of the leukemia after transplant. Why it doesn't always work, you know, that's another uh, opportunity for engineering. So the haploidentical transplants with post-transplant cyclophosphamide has really extended the application, especially because the early, the early attempts with haploidentical transplant were disastrous, with patients having graft rejection and severe graft-versus-host disease. But with this platform, as you see here, there is 
about 30% of a grade two graft versus host disease with hardly any severe graft versus host disease uh, of the acute kind for these patients and very little late uh, chronic graft versus host disease. Of course, for that there is a price to pay and the price is that the risk of relapse is much greater. And the risk of relapse after this uh, type of transplant, at least in the reduced intensity setting, is in the order of 50 to 55%, uh, which results in the disease-free survival and overall survivals that are comparable to the other donor types. So in going back to that uh, original slide saying that we get there by different means, so in haploidentical transplants, we're trading off um, lower graft-versus-host disease, lower mortality, uh, from toxicity but increased relapse and resulting in similar survivals. Uh, the Hopkins group that uh, developed this, they actually looked and, uh, at disease risk and there is this new way to uh, calculate disease risk which is the um, DRI, uh, the disease risk index uh, that was developed in Boston and they found that if you have low risk disease and you undergo that type of transplant, you have you know, a, a, a low uh, risk of relapse, and you have good progression-free survival. But if you have more advanced or higher risk disease, you have you know, a much greater risk of relapse. But keep in mind that this is a large proportion of patients we're treating. So we need to work, and the uh, tra transplant centers in general and the blood and marrow transplant clinical trials network are working on strategies of maintenance therapy post-transplant and other um, or immune modulation that could potentially uh, improve the results for this uh, high-risk patients here. And I'm going to change gears for the last time now to talk to you about core blood transplant. I think I'm more or less on time. Uh, the advantages of core blood transplant is that the units are readily available. Um, it used to be faster, but it's still pretty fast. They're just sitting in the core blood bank. You just have to ask for them. Uh, AGLA matching is less frequently a barrier. Um, we, the standard of matching for cord blood is lower than unrelated adult donors. Especially if you consider the fact that most cord blood transplants are mismatched, uh, although we've been finding better and better units, better matched units for our patients in the U.S., uh, the risk of gra acute and chronic graft versus host disease is relatively low. There is very low risk of infection transmission. Uh, if sometimes, you know, if you test cord blood for uh, CMV antibodies, you will find, but they come from the mother very rare transmission of disease from cord blood, and there is absolutely no risk to the donor. Uh, the disadvantage of cord blood is the delayed engraftment, which increases the risk of early mortality, and this is very important because uh, there is a lot of effort in cord blood expansion. I'll show an example at the end. Uh, donor lymphocytes uh, for the treatment relapse, uh, uh, relapse or chimerism are typically not available, but um, there is certainly uh, an opportunity here to get small aliquots, save some lymphocytes, grow them in the laboratory, and have them ready for the future. It's not being used clinically, though. Uh, and then there's the fixed cell dose, which uh, for many years was overcome with the use of two umbilical cord blood units to transplant for an adult patient. Because if you're a child, um, you can usually find an adequate uh, uh, cord blood unit. Uh, more recently, it's become very evident. You know, for years, you know, Dan showed you that graphic. When cord blood exploded as an alternative donor type, it was because it was closing a gap uh, that we had in donors. And at that time, you know, the system grew and a lot of more regulation and, and the cost of core blood units has risen substantially. And it's created kind of a crisis right now, uh, even with insurance companies, because a single core blood unit can cost as much as $50,000 um, by the time it's given to the patient. So if you're doing a two core blood unit transplant, you're starting from a cost of $100,000 uh, before you even gave the cells to the patient. The way we select cord blood is by uh, getting units with a, above a threshold of cell dose of uh, 2.5 times 10 to the 7 per kilo uh, of nucleated cells. And uh, by matching at HLA class 2 at the allele level and HLA A and B at the antigen level, uh, there are a number of studies uh, looking at other factors to finally refine that. I think... Most centers still start here, but then when they're further selecting their units, they're now going to the CD34 cell dose, which was uncommon before, using a low level matching in all loci, considering HLAC, and a number of other variables that can refine your search when you have several units to choose from, which is not always possible, and in that case, you can go with that old standard 
and you still have the outcomes that we see in the manuscripts that I showed you earlier in this presentation. Uh, as I mentioned to you, there is single and double cord transplant. The double cord, the idea was to get more cells to transplant larger people. Uh, the average age of the patients we see in Minnesota were very well nourished. Uh, it's probably in the range of 85 to 90 kilos. Uh, whereas uh, if you go to uh, Japan, which is another place where core blood is very popular, their median weight is around 70 kilos. So here was harder to find single units. But the outcomes with single or double units, this is a CIBMTR study. These are both, and this is a prospective randomized study in children, shows that there is no uh, disadvantage or there is, no there is no disadvantage for double core transplants in adults uh, when, the, when the two units are suboptimally dosed. But for children, going above the minimal threshold did not bring any additional benefits. Uh, some recent data from our center, we, we now, you know, like others, we were looking at HLA matching. And one of the things we found is if you look at patients with acute leukemia, we found that the more mismatched here with two mismatches here and looking at the allele level, the more mismatched grafts had a lower risk of relapse and had better disease-free survival. Um, I cannot tell you the headache to publish this paper because it goes against the grain. Remember, with unrelated donor match, if you increase mismatch, you increase mortality, you don't affect relapse, and you worsen disease-free survival. So this goes exactly the opposite. But essentially, this is what our data showed. And then more recently, the Seattle group published their experience showing that, it's particular with patients with minimal residual disease, when they received cord blood transplants as compared to other donor types, they have a lower relapse rate and better disease-free survival compared to HLA-matched and HLA-mismatched unrelated donors. So novel strategies to uh, improve cord blood, one of them is expansion with this um, uh, SR1 stem regenin-1. Uh, this is something that was performed at the University of Minnesota in collaboration with Novartis. And um, the idea was to expand cord blood, uh, a cord blood unit, ultimately going back to the single cord blood uh, transplant. The unit was expanded, it was uh, CD34 uh, selected ahead of time and expanded with the SR1 reagent in the culture with cytokines. And then the CD34 negative fraction was cryopreserved and given afterwards so that we had immune cells to promote long-term engraftment of these uh, progenitors that were expanded. And what we found, and this is now uh, published um, in cell stem cells, is that the expanded group uh, engrafted much faster perhaps reducing that risk of early mortality that I just described to you in the first uh, couple of slides as compared to the conventional double cord transplants that had an engraftment time of all seven to 10 days later and not as complete as those with expanded unit. But the engineering in cord blood doesn't stop there and there's many more examples. Another example from our institution is the use of uh, regulatory T cells derived from yet a second or a third cord blood unit, not the one that's directed for the graft and you see that when we grow those cells using artificial antigen presenting cells for a stimulation of that culture with IL-2, um, we have very low risk of graft versus host disease. Albeit in very small number of patients, is still a very good sign and we're trying to pursue this further. But then to conclude and going back to my first slide, you know, finding a donor for a patient nowadays is no longer a problem most of the time, unless you don't get along with your children. But, um, so the first thing we do, we look for a sibling donor in the family. And if the sibling is matched, we can go to transplant if he's healthy. But if the sibling is not healthy or he's not a match, uh, we go for uh, an unrelated uh, donor search. But we already know if the sibling is half matched, so he can still be a donor. Uh, and we are going to ask you during the first visit whether you have children, biological children, right? Adopters don't count. Um, and in that case, we, we also start the unrelated donor search through the registry at the same time. And it's, I think most, if not all large transplant centers, when they search for an unrelated donor or core blood, they search for both at the same time. And uh, you do the search, and very rapidly, you can determine if the patient has a seven or eight of eight unrelated donor, core blood, or a partially matched related donor. And then, how you go about that? Well, you go to transplant, but you know, the decision of how you get here will really depend on your institution uh, and what you prefer. If, 
If your institution is finding better ways, trying to study better ways to match, you're going to go here. If you're studying cord blood here and haplos, you go there. So in conclusion, alternative donors are available alternatives to sibling donors and can bridge the gap, or donor, in gap in donor availability. Today, we can find a donor, if not for every, for almost everybody, uh, to choose children well. At this point, the choice of alternative donor is really dependent on the transplant center urgency because the unrelated donor takes a little longer to get ready to go. Haplo and cords are very fast, so if you have an urgent transplant for someone with high-risk leukemia, uh, you'll go to alternative donors. And in the future, we're hoping that donor choice will hopefully be driven by prospective randomized data, such as the BMT-CTN uh, 1101, which is now randomizing patients between haploidentical and double umbilical cord blood transplants. It's the first prospective study of this kind that I'm aware of. Uh, we have 270 patients enrolled out of 410 who are hoping to conclude this study in the next couple of years, and then um, a few years down the road, we'll have the results of this study. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any pressing questions right now. Thank you. <laughs>